Angela Renee Buck, 37 years old, from North Pilot Grove Road in Waterloo, Iowa. Went missing August the 9th, 1995. On Friday, August 11th, 1995, two men hunting for turtles discovered a body in a ditch near a creek on North Pilot Grove Road in Black Hawk County, Iowa. The body clad in a green halter top, jean shorts, and muddy white socks with no shoes lay just below a short bridge in a wooded area about one and a half miles east of Independence Avenue in Waterloo. Black Hawk County Sheriff's Office officials on Saturday identified the body as Angela Renee Buck, 37, after comparing fingerprints and dental records. They believed she had been dead for no more than two days and released her identity on Sunday after contacting her family. The state medical examiner conducted the autopsy at the Broadlawns Medical Center in Des Moines, Iowa, and ruled the cause of death as a single gunshot wound to the chest. The manner of death was ruled a homicide. There appeared to be no attempt to hide the body. According to uh, a story published August the 12th in the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier, Jeff Edgar, 33, of Waterloo, and Brad Haig, 34, of Jessup, worked together at Eagle Tanning Company in Waterloo and had just finished the third shift. At around 10 a.m. Friday, they decided to go looking for a place to set up turtle traps. As they crossed the North Pilot Grove Road Bridge around 10.45 a.m., they saw the body about six feet from the water. We just kind of looked at each other, not really knowing what to do, and we just kind of stayed away from the body, he said. Um, neither one of us went near that body. They went to Laura Hansen's nearby farmhouse to call the police. Haig said the woman lay in a fetal position, and there was no apparent attempt to hide the body because it could be easily seen from the bridge. He said he didn't notice a large number of footprints in the area, but that it appeared a nearby pool of shallow water might have held a trace of blood. Twenty investigators worked the scene until the night, and they searched the creek, fields, and ditches. They carried away bags of what appeared to be evidence. Jim Anderson, who lived at the farmhouse in sight of the bridge, where the body was found, told the courier he was called to the scene Friday and asked if the creek had recently been flooded. I think they were wondering if maybe she had washed down the creek. Um, her body was in a fetal position. I don't know. Two deputies were stationed at the scene Saturday, stopping cars and recording names and license plate numbers. On Sunday, August the 13th, Black Hawk County Sheriff's Office announced it was handling the case as a homicide. Officials said they weren't sure if the body had been dumped in the creek or if the death had occurred there. Officials said Buck did not have a permanent address, but she was from the Waterloo area. She had worked as a nurse aide and later worked at Ravenswood Health Care Center. She had been attending school to become a radio announcer. She had a big heart. She cared about people. She worried about things, the stress of life and things like that, said her cousin, Rick. He said the death of Buck's mother, Lorraine, had been very difficult for Angela. Lorraine, a former city council member, had passed away three years earlier after a lengthy illness. The family was shocked when they learned of Angela's death. According to her aunt, 
Pauline Hoosman of Grundy Center, Angela had been living with her mother in Evansville, but began to drift after her mother died. Her whole life has been sad, she said. She reported that Betty Stewart of Waterloo had rented part of the duplex at 110 Prince Street to Buck. Stewart described Buck as a lonely person with a fast-paced lifestyle. According to the article, Buck rented out the bottom three rooms of the duplex. She lived there for about four months, but she left in the fall. She was a good person. She was just mixed up, she told the courier. I think she needed help. I think she needed counseling. I think if she could have gotten some help and gotten out of that lifestyle, but she would have to but she wouldn't have been around the type of people that she was. Buck had let her children go live with their father, and Stewart said Buck missed them very much. She spoke of her children very often and wanted to introduce them to her neighbors. It's sad what happened to her. So, three days before finding her body, officials found the body of 24-year-old Connie Jo Choet Bodensteiner of Des Moines in the basement of a storage unit of a Des Moines apartment building. Bodensteiner had been strangled to death. Both women had records of prostitution and at one time both had worked for Greg Peterson. A John, it says here in parentheses, who operated a prostitution service out of his home. Well, if he was operating a prostitution service, he was a pimp, not a john. Inve and authorities investigated the connection between the two murders, but said they don't believe they were connected. Their paths had crossed, but there was nothing we could find that says these two murders were related. Well, they knew each other, they knew the same people. They were murdered and found murdered within days of each other. So that right there is enough to say there's possibly a link here. It is reported that a business rival beat Peterson to death in August of 1994. On August the 12th, an article in the Courier before officials had formally identified Angela Buck's body had confirmed the body in Black Hawk County was not that of missing Mason City anchorwoman Jody Hoosenstrut, who apparently had been abducted from her home about six weeks earlier. Now, there you go. There's number three. There's three women within a very short period of time within a very short area, a distance of each other, related or not related. This I, re, I remember the story of this Jody Hoosenstrut, and I may be saying her name wrong. I hope I'm not. Of course, that was a big story, but they would not have linked her to these two women because she was a professional anchor woman on TV and not a prostitute. Investigators still haven't given up on bringing a perpetrator to justice. Angela Renee Buck was born April the 17th, 1958, in Waterloo, Iowa. She was the daughter of Richard and Lorraine Crowley Buck. Her mother, Lorraine, served on the Evansdale City Council in 1990, and she died in 1992. Angela married Dwight R. Shelton in Waterloo, on October the 22nd, 1976. The couple had two daughters and a son before they got divorced in 1984. Well, there is always the possibility that the ex, husband, or boyfriend could be involved here, and if they had gotten divorced in November of 1984, she and her ex-husband shared joint custody of the children who lived with their mother. Angela would later have another son. Family and friends described Angela as a woman with a big heart who loved all of her children. 
but she fell on hard times and got involved with the wrong crowd. She was voted Evansdale Junior Miss in 1970 at the age of 12. She played the violin in the school orchestra and loved riding horses. Prior to her death, she was working toward getting her life back together and had been attending school in Madison, Wisconsin. I want people to keep one thing in mind. This Jody Hoosenstrut that went missing was a TV anchor woman. This woman was going to school to study to become a radio announcer. Is there a possibility that there was someone involved in the school who knew Jody Hoosenstrut through her job as a TV anchor woman or maybe had known her in her, her education leading up to becoming a TV anchor woman who also came into contact with this Angela Buck. That is something that people might want to keep in mind. Cedar Valley Crime Stoppers is offering a $1,500 reward for information in Angela Buck's unsolved murder. Launched in June of 2012, Cedar Valley Crime Stoppers is a, has a goal to keep Cedar Valley neighborhoods safe. The program follows citizens. The program allows citizens to report suspicious and criminal behavior while remaining anonymous. Anyone with any information about Angela Buck's unsolved murder is asked to call the Black Hawk County Sheriff at 319-291-2587. Or you may remain anonymous and contact the Cedar Valley Crime Stoppers at 855-300-TIPS-8477. There could be something on here about her in the comments. I used to go to Reddit very often for these stories, but it seems like lately as many missing, as many threads as there are dedicated to the missing, murdered, and unsolved on Reddit, it seems like it's so hard to find really anything other than when a case is solved and then they run that story, but this is from Iowa Code Cases on Web Sleuths, and this is dated of 2009. Uh, the Iowa Code Cases website has been working since 2005 to list and cross-reference by city and county all the state's unsolved homicides. So it doesn't really have anything specifically about her. I continued doing some research to try to find any new updates or anything different about Angela Buck. And I decided to look at this girl, or this young woman, who was found murdered around the same time. And it was reported that they may have known each other. Um, they, they were thought to know the same man who was reportedly a pimp who was doing prostitution services out of a mobile home in that area. So I wanted to come back and read a little bit about her. And first I'll just say I apologize if I get her name wrong. Connie, Connie Jo Chowett Bodensteiner. Um, she was 24 years old and she was from Des Moines, Iowa. On Tuesday, August the 8th, 1995, Connie Jo was found locked in a basement storage bin at a South Side Des Moines apartment complex. An autopsy showed the 24-year-old had been strangled. A maintenance worker discovered her body, which had a strap or a belt tied around her neck. In the Cedar Rapids Gazette article dated Friday, August 11th, 1995, Bodensteiner's mother, Sandy, of New Providence, said her daughter had run into problems before she was killed. She just chose a rough life, she said. She dropped out of school in the 10th grade. Police Lieutenant Clarence Job told the Gazette that Connie Jo had been arrested four times on prostitution charges and once on drug-related charges. According to her mother, 
Bowden Steiner and her husband, Michael, had a stormy marriage and separated in 1992. Sandy and her husband, Randy, pled with their daughter to return to New Providence, but Bowden Steiner always returned to Des Moines. She told the Gazette the last time she saw her daughter was July the 23rd, when she came to New Providence to see her five-year-old daughter, Brittany. Brittany had been living with Connie Joe's parents. At, at first, authorities wondered if her murder was connected to that of 37-year-old Angela Buck of Waterloo. The day after Connie Joe's body was found, Buck was found near a creek with a single gunshot wound. Des Moines Police Sergeant Tom Trimble said that both women had records of prostitution and had both once worked for the same person. Officials later determined the two women's deaths were not connected. Connie Jo was born December the 15th, 1970 in Ames, Iowa. She was raised in New Providence where she attended school. And... I'm really struggling with them not that they're not being a connection here. They said that this man, this um, pimp, who they called in the article a John, they said that he was beaten to death. So well, I'm wondering, did the people that beat him to death come back later for these two women? Because maybe they thought. Um, that they knew something, that they might be a trial going to happen. and So I've been trying to find something about this Greg Peterson who was connected to both of these women and apparently was in some kind of a pimp or something like that. And I, the only thing I found was on a... a Law page, State of Iowa versus Montez, Short Ridge. Greg Peterson. Okay, so apparently this is the person who supposedly beat this man to death. Montez Short Ridge appeals the judgment and sentence following his conviction for first degree murder. He claims there was insufficient evidence to support the jury's verdict. The district court erred by admitting hearsay testimony. He says his due process rights were violated and the district court erred by failing to give limiting instruction on prior bad acts. Greg Peterson was brutally beaten to death in his home August 13, 1994. Peterson operated an out-call prostitution service from his mobile home. He made, he made, a, he, he received an agency fee for setting up appointments between women and their customers. Shortridge also operated such a service. Pursuant to a plea deal, Orlando Proctor told how Peterson was killed. He testified as follows, Montez Shortridge Orlando Proctor and Rick Benton, Jr. planned to break into Peterson's home to steal $10,000. They changed into dark clothing, drove to Peterson's home, and entered the unlocked door. Proctor immediately began searching the living room and kitchen for money. While he was searching, he heard noises coming from the bedroom. Benton entered the living room and removed an electrical cord from a lamp. Peterson ended up lying naked on the bedroom floor with his hands and feet bound with electrical cords. Short Ridge was standing over Peterson with his hands bowed into fists. After leaving Peterson's home, the group stopped at a payphone and made two phone calls to 911, reporting a disturbance at Peterson's residence. The police discovered Peterson's dead, badly beaten body on the bathroom floor. Dr. Thomas Bennett, performing an autopsy, determined severe blows to the head was the cause of death. 
He estimates his death to be sometime between midnight and 5 a.m. Jerry Hatton lived with Shortridge and worked for him as a prostitute at the time of the murder. She testified during an offer of proof of um, outside of the jury's presence. Her videotape testimony was later played to the jury, but the videotape was not formally admitted. She testified that Shortridge bailed her out of jail that day. When he bailed her out, he noticed when he bailed her out, she noticed he was wearing a gold ring, a dark cell phone, and some mo and had a lot of money. After they arrived at the apartment, she discovered a bag of dark, dirty clothing, which were which she described as smelling like rotten meat. She was watching a daytime news broadcast when Peterson's picture appeared. Shortridge told Hatton he didn't look like that when I was through with him. Proctor's girlfriend testified she overheard Proctor and Shortridge planning a burglary. She also testified that Proctor was upset when he came home following the incident and told her Montez just wouldn't stop beating on him. While Shortridge was in jail, he wrote a series of letters to his friend Michael Morris, asking Morris to provide him an alibi. At the time, Shortridge wrote, Nobody knows the time of death but me and Junior. Following a jury trial, Shortridge was convicted of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Then he filed an appeal. I find it very suspicious that these two women, who were both linked to this Peterson, who was beat to death, were murdered basically a day apart, and yet the police found no evidence. I mean, the police would not, they refused to say that these two cases were linked. Did anyone look into the fact that maybe they had Either one of them might have been going to testify against this guy, you know? Because think about that. If they both worked for this Peterson as prostitutes, is it possible that they had had um, some interaction with him and the women that he worked, you know, that he put out on the streets? So... That's just a theory. It's kind of far-fetched, but, but not really when you think about it. All these people knew each other. All these people interacted. They all ran in the same circle, and they were all doing the same illegal activity. Is it possible that Angela Buck, who was murdered one day after this Connie Joe was murdered, is it possible that she knew something about Connie Joe's murder? Is it possible that this Connie Joe had reached out to her? And maybe whoever murdered Connie Joe went and took um, took care of Angela because she thought she knew something. They, they thought she knew something. I mean, we see stuff like that on TV and we see stuff like that in the movies and sometimes stuff like that is real. And it's very, very hard for me to separate these cases and just say these were all isolated, random incidences. And I don't think the police believe that either. How could the police believe that? How could the police really sit there and say, ah, we, you know, there's no possible way that this was connected. It just goes on to say, Shortridge's first assertion is that there was a lack of physical evidence connecting him to the crime. He maintains the medical evidence supported his theory the beating was brutal and short rather than long and drawn out, as it was described by Proctor. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, the, the death might have been short and quick. The first, second blow may have killed him. And this guy may have just kept on beating on him, you know. But I'm just continuing to read on down here to see if they make any mention of anything to do with any other witnesses. And I just wonder if, um, 
if these two women knew something about this and maybe they thought this this short ridge or his people may have thought that these two women or even other women i don't know that any other women may not have known about this and this leads me to wonder if this jody Husenstrut, this uh, tv anchor woman who went missing uh, was covering this story you know because you know there there's a link here maybe not her her case may be isolated to a stalker um but these other women i definitely believe and that's my own personal theory i just want to point that out there and just say that i'm not asking anybody else to see things my way or to believe what i believe or what i think I said this um, Angela Buck was going to school to study to become a um, radio announcer. It's very possible that someone she came into contact with through her training or, or going to school and study and may also have worked at this um, TV station and knew this woman. Maybe it was just someone who liked to stalk women. But then again... Let me say this. It doesn't say if either one of these women were sexually assaulted or anything of that nature. It doesn't say. And if she was shot with a single gunshot wound to the chest and that was the way she died and there was no rape or assault or brutalization of her body or anything like that, then I would say that this was not a serial killer. This was not a man who was... A you know, abducting women for some type of pleasure. This was someone who wanted her dead, wanted her dead very quickly. So Jody Husenstrud, I looked up to see if she, you know, when this trial went took place and when she went missing and if there's any news footage of her talking about this. So I don't know. I couldn't find anything about that. I'm not going to get into her story here. Because I didn't want this video to be very long. And it already is. But I just wonder, you know, about that. Because, um... What types of stories did she cover? And is it possible that maybe she did know something about this? I don't know. To kind of put her over on the side. As a, like a side category here. I will end this video by just saying this. I believe that this these two cases of these two women were connected. Um, I believe these were hits of some kind by someone who... And, and I'm not saying, and, and I could be completely wrong here. I don't know if the, the police or the courts knew if, the, if either of these two women were going to be called for any kind of testimony or if they already had been or if they knew anything about this it's too much of a coincidence in my opinion and I'm not a police detective or anything like that but I just can't end this video without just saying if they ever want to get to the bottom of either of these murders they need to start connecting the dots in my opinion that's all I have to say, and I appreciate you all for taking the time to listen.